everyone. Welcome once again to Relay Tutorials that is relevant, easy learning, accessible to you. While we all face this global pandemic with full courage and high hopes, let us continue learning new things, new skills, and we must continue taking all the necessary precautions. Today's video is about a very interesting and very tricky topic called as ovarian cyst. Why I say it as tricky or uh, a very mysterious one? Because sometimes there are no symptoms at all. A woman might just walk into a clinic with an ultrasound report showing an ovarian cyst and she has no symptoms at all. Or maybe some vague symptoms like bloating, some gastrointestinal symptoms or a uh, dull ache in lower abdomen, that's all. So it is very important to know how to investigate these cases how to further manage them and what is the follow-up. And when I say ovarian cysts, it can present either in a pre-menopausal age group or in a post-menopausal age group. The first video would be about ovarian cyst in a pre-menopausal age group and the next video would be about uh, post-menopausal age group because both the, uh, kind of, both the kind of patients have to be dealt separately. It is very logical to understand that if there is any activity in your reproductive system after the cessation of menses or what we call as menopause, it has to be dealt with much more seriousness and management slightly differs in that age group. So let us uh, read about it, let us uh, hear more about it and I hope you really like this video and let me know your feedback in the comments below. So let's move on to our topic, ovarian cyst or ovarian mass. Uh, as I uh, said earlier in this video that the presentation varies in different age groups and management also varies in different age groups. So there will be a small series of videos uh, related to this topic. We will try to cover all the age groups like ovarian cyst or ovarian mass in a young girl and then in a reproductive age group and finally in a postmenopausal age group. The first video mainly focuses the premenopausal age group and it is more of an introductory video. Uh, try to learn about the various uh, signs and symptoms uh, the lady can present with, what are the initial investigations uh, you should prescribe her, what are the various scorings and the whole idea to differentiate a benign from a malignant one or a suspicious one and further how do you manage them and follow them up like for a benign cyst you wouldn't like to go for a surgical intervention and if it is a malignant one you have to undergo uh, you have to undertake that patient for a staging laparotomy and things like that so let's begin with the introduction in premenopausal women majority ovarian masses and cysts are benign the overall incidence of a symptomatic ovarian cyst in a premenopausal female being malignant or cancerous is approximately 1 in 1000 increasing to 3 in 1000 at the age of 50. Up to 10% of women across the world and various ethnic groups will have some form of surgery during their lifetime for the presence of an ovarian mass. 10% of suspected ovarian masses are ultimately found to be non-ovarian in origin. They look like ovarian but when you really look into them it turn out to be some appendicular mass or a para ovarian cyst or some sort of a sub serous fibroid. So these are those differential diagnoses. Up to 20 percent of borderline ovarian tumors uh, we will discuss this topic as well. Borderline ovarian tumors as the name suggests is somewhere between benign and malignant. They have a malignant potential. They may appear as simple cyst on ultrasonography. What are other types of adenexial masses or you know if you look into the differential diagnosis? Benign ovarian cyst could be functional cyst, it could be an endometrioma or chocolate cyst, serous cyst adenoma, mucinous cyst adenoma, mature teratoma. Benign non-ovarian cyst could be a paratubal cyst, a hydrosalphinx. Uh, a dilated fallopian tube, it can be a pyosalphinx as well, tubo ovarian abscess, peritoneal pseudocyst, appendiceal abscess, diverticular abscess, pelvic kidney. Then 
There can be primary malignant ovarian tumors like germ cell, epithelial, sex cord tumors, secondary malignant ovarian tumors, predominantly the primary site is breast or gastrointestinal carcinomas. When I uh, talk about malignant ovarian tumors or benign one, there is a whole chart of classification. I'm sure you guys ref are referring to your textbooks as well. And in the subsequent videos, we would uh, present the entire classification. Let us look into the signs and symptoms. If such a patient walks into your clinic, you know, uh, with some dull ache and uh, uh, let's say bloating and some change in appetite and there are not much of menstrual problems and you look at her and she's like 35, 40 age group. What all points in your history taking you must take are women with specific you should give a specific attention to risk factors or protective factors for ovarian malignancy and a family history of ovarian or breast cancer. Risk factors include age older than 60 years, if she's that old lady, postmenopausal, yes, she ha has a higher risk of developing an ovarian cancer. Early menarche and a late menopause. If you look into this, you know, it will appear very logical. Any woman who has attained menarche early in her life and attained menopause a bit late suggests that her ovaries have been active for a longer period of time. And some researchers think that this sort of a continuous ovulation gives a risk for ovarian cancer. There is a trauma to her ovary. There is this like theory behind it which can give rise to epithelial tumors. Nulliparity, again, Nulliparity suggests that there have been no pregnancy, so there have been no long periods of anovulation. So again, the ovaries were constantly ovulating and that is how it is linked to ovarian cancer risk. Infertility, again, no pregnancy, more risk. Personal history of breast or colon cancer, you know, to the patient itself. And family history of breast, colon and ovarian cancers. Breast, colon and ovarian, these, these are linked through various inherited or familial cancer syndromes like HNPCC and there are genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 which are familial. So uh, then you have to look into the risk factors like young age at breast cancer diagnosis or bilateral breast cancer, family history of breast and ovarian cancer, multiple cases of breast cancers in the family and a male family member with breast cancer they are associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations and they predispose women to an increased risk of ovarian malignancy. Then there can be symptoms suggestive of endometriosis like dull ache, dyskesia, dyspareunia. They should be specifically considered and there are other symptoms suggesting possible ovarian malignancy like persistent abdominal distension, appetite change including increased satiety, you know, bloating, some pelvic or abdominal pain and sometimes if it's a big mass it can uh, lead to some pressure symptoms like increased urinary urgency or frequency. Ovarian masses are mostly asymptomatic, they are detected at late stage majorly with complaints of abdominal discomfort and if it is a bigger mass, it can present with pressure symptoms like urinary retention and uh, pedal edema and even varicosity of lower limbs. Depending upon their origin, sometimes they can even present with virilizing symptoms like acne or hirsutism, clitoromegaly. Menstrual cycles, they do not generally get affected unless there are sex cord stromal tumors which can present with menorrhagia, there are virilizing tumors which can give rise to delayed cycles or amenorrhea or there are feminizing granulosa cell tumors or benign Brenner tumors which can present with hyperestrogenic symptoms like postmenopausal bleeding or menorrhagia or changes in menstrual cycles. There can be secondary complications like torsion, rupture, hemorrhage and these are acute emergencies and patients would present with acute abdomen and sometimes even in a state of shock. What will you find on physical examination? I have dealt uh, this physical examination in detail in my previous video, so we will just revise it a little bit. 
A careful physical examination of the women is essential and it should include abdominal and vaginal examination or internal examination and also look for the presence or absence of local lymphadenopathy like an inguinal region. In acute presentation with pain, the diagnosis of torsion, rupture and hemorrhage should be made on the basis of vitals and even on palpation of abdomen you will find a lot of tenderness. Although clinical examination has poor sensitivity in the detection, it ranges somewhere around 15 to 50 percent, its importance lies in the evaluation of tenderness, the mobility, if there are any nodularity, you can even have some idea of the consistency whether it is purely cystic or cystic to firm or hard or there is presence or absence of ascites along with it. Investigations. Now here lies you know some breakthrough in the diagnosis. What blood tests should ideally be performed or you know advised apart from the routine ones? There are certain tumor markers and most important one is CA125. But it needs not to be undertaken in all premenopausal women if an ultrasound diagnosis of a simple cyst has already been made. There are other tumor markers like LDH, alpha fetoprotein, SCG which should be measured in all women under age 50 with a complex ovarian mass because of the possibility of origin of germ cell tumors. CA125 is primarily a marker for epithelial ovarian carcinoma and it is raised in 50% of early stage disease. If you'll ask me what is the single most effective way of ev evaluating an ovarian mass, then that is transvaginal sonography, TVS, remember that. The routine use of CD scan and MRI for assessment of ovarian masses, they do not improve the sensitivity or specificity obtained by a TVS alone in the detection of ovarian malignancy. Now here is something very interesting, IOTA that is International Ovarian Tumor Analysis and is solely based on your ultrasound findings. So we have B rules, B stand for benign and M rules that is malignant. I want all of you to memorize it and it's very simple. Let's look into the B rules first. Unilocular cyst, uh, just imagine a single unilocular cyst filled with serous fluid, it will go in favor of benign ovarian mass. Presence of acoustic shadowing, it is again one of the ultrasound features. Now you find some solid components but the largest solid component is less than 7 millimeter. Now this is one figure which you need to remember. And if it is a smooth multi, even a multilocular tumor with the largest diameter less than 100 millimeter or less than 10 centimeter, it goes in favor of benign origin. And when you put a Doppler or a color Doppler, there is no blood flow. Now looking into the M rules which go in favor of malignancy, irregular solid tumor, see very logical. Presence of ascites, yes, it goes in favor of malignancy. Then there are at least four papillary structures inside the ovarian mass. And you have a multilocular solid tumor but with very irregular margins and with largest diameter more than 100 millimeter. And when you put color Doppler, there is a very strong blood flow. Now these go in favor of malignancy. It has a reported sensitivity of 95% and specificity as high as 91%. Now there is another uh, index called as risk malignancy index. I'm sure some of you must be familiar with it, RMI score. It combines three pre-surgical features, serum CA125, menopausal status and ultrasound score. CA125 and menopausal status, very easy. CA125, you just have to take the exact figure in international unit per ml and just put just like that in the score. Menopausal status, simple. If lady is premenopausal, she will be scored as 1. As I said, this age group will have lower risk of malignancy. And if it is 
postmenopausal lady, then she is scored as 3. Then ultrasound uh, scoring, there is one point for each characteristics. And what are those? Multiloculuses, solid areas, metastasis, ascites and bilateral lesions. So there are these five features. If none of them are there, the ultrasound score of 0 is being taken and see how it will make the whole RMI as 0. If there is a presence of one of these features, then the ultrasound score is 1. But if there are two or more than two such features present, the score to be taken is as 3. So it's 0, 1 and 3 and you put that as a figure and you multiply these 3. If the final score turns out to be more than 200, she has a high index of suspicion for malignancy. I hope you got some brief idea of how to differentiate them between benign and malignant. Management of ovarian mass is presumed to be benign in non-emergency situations. We already know the emergency ones. All those who present with acute abdomen and where you suspect torsion or hemorrhage or rupture and you know you can have a good idea after looking into her vitals doing a per abdomen examination and putting a probe of an ultrasound can give you an idea about these acute conditions. Now presuming that they are benign and they are in non-emergency situation there is a role of expectant management. Women with small simple ovarian cysts which are less than 50 millimeters or less than 5 centimeter they do not require a follow-up as they are very likely to be physiological like follicular cyst or corpus luteal cyst or simple hemorrhagic cyst and they almost always resolve within three menstrual cycles. Now women with simple ovarian cyst as diagnosed on your transvaginal ultrasound okay they are, these are all diagnoses on, on, on your ultrasound. So if it is between 50 to 70 millimeters, that is 5 to 7 centimeters, they should have a yearly ultrasound follow-up. And those with larger simple cyst should be considered for further imaging or surgical intervention. And when I say surgical intervention, the laparoscopic approach is associated with lower post-operative morbidity and shorter recovery time and is preferred to laparotomy in suitable patients. It is cost effective because of the associated early discharge and return to work. But if we are suspecting malignancy, patient might be considered for a staging laparotomy. In presence of large masses with solid components, laparotomy may be is more appropriate. Spillage of content should be avoided where possible as preoperative and intraoperative assessment cannot absolutely preclude malignancy. Chemical peritonitis due to spillage of dermoid cyst contents has been reported in different series to occur in less than 0.2% of cases. And in case you come across an endometrioma or a chocolate cyst, which is greater than 3 cm in diameter, histology must be obtained to identify endometriosis and also to exclude rare cases of malignancy. I hope you got some clarity about the presentation, diagnosis and differentiation between benign and malignant and further management of ovarian masses in premenopausal age group. I am going to extend this topic in postmenopausal and young age girls also and we will be soon putting up those videos as well. If you really like our videos, please do subscribe to Relay Tutorials. Thank you for watching. Do submit your valuable suggestion and feedback in the comments below. Take care.